Welcome to Village Church Online. My name is Jeremy. I am the senior pastor of Village Church, and I'm really glad that you've chosen to join us. We're gonna continue in our series in the book of Amos and hear from Pastor Chris in a moment. But first, if you wanna connect with us, I would encourage you to connect with us deeper because we'd love to get to know you a little bit more and know who it is that's a part of our Village Church online community. Before we hear from Pastor Chris though, one little thing. I got the opportunity to have a conversation with Caitlin, who is our Global and City Impact Director about some of the updates around the incredible work that is going on that God is doing through our church all around the world uh, to bring justice and hope to people who, uh, who really, really need it. And just to remind you, this is only possible because of the amazing way that you generously partner with us financially. This is how we're able to do some of this stuff. So um, listen up and let's hear about some of the amazing things that God is doing all over the world through Village Church. Hey, Village Church, how are you doing today? Oh boy, okay. Uh, my name is Jeremy, I'm a senior pastor here at Village Church and I want to give a big welcome to someone. Uh, this is the director of our Global and City Impact Caitlin Weinberger, give it up for Caitlin Weinberger. She does an amazing job. And we have a couple updates for you. Now, a year ago, uh, we told you all about some work we were doing in the country of Cuba. And it's been some really exciting work. We actually had the chance to go back to Cuba just recently. And so give us the update. What's going on in Cuba? Tell us all about it. Yes, thank you, Jer, and hello, everyone. So we have been really excited about the partnership in Cuba since we were there last year, and we've maintained relationship, and so this time we had the opportunity to go back with a couple of our other staff members to do some more production training and social media training, and then Pastor Jeremy did a couple sessions with a couple groups of pastors, which went really well, and so we had a really awesome time just really spending time with lots of their team. We also visited over 15 church plants, which is crazy. And what was really exciting about some of those is they had just been a vision the year prior. So we would go visit a pastor and he would point out saying, I'm gonna plant a church in that area. I'm gonna plant a church in that area. And so we actually got to see some of those church plants. So they were not only planted, but they were already bursting at the seams. People were filling the rooms and they're outgrowing their spaces. And that was a common theme of spaces being outgrown. And so we're gonna to continue to come alongside them, um, help them find some long-term sustainable solutions, as well as continue supporting them in training. So we're really excited. Jer, what was meaningful for you about doing the session with the pastors? Yeah, it was really humbling. Uh, first, I'd like to just thank you though, because uh, over the last year you have given two church planting initiatives directly, and that's the reason why we've been able to do this work. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, doing these seminars and these trainings, it was really humbling. I mean, first of all, what I really love about what Caitlin does is, is just the way she leads our approach to this kind of work. So we don't go in saying, hey, we're from Canada, we're gonna tell you how to do things. Uh, it's a very, very different approach. We go and we partner with people and we say, you tell us how we can serve you the best. And so that's how this was all set up. And so they asked us to come and do certain things. Uh, you know, as Caitlin's learned on these trips with me, I will commit myself to all sorts of things in the moment. And one last year was, I'll totally come back and do pastor's training with you if you want. And so we did, and, uh, and I did. But uh, it was humbling. What we talked about was really how we can, as pastors and leaders, um, navigate this tension between having the humility of Christ in how we lead, but at the same time, tapping into the confidence we have to have in the power of the God we serve and who is doing the work through us and calling us to it. And if we can marry those two things together, anything is possible, obviously. And so it was really cool to do this uh, training in a couple different cities with them and, uh, and just to see how they were engaging and, and the blessing that was both to them, but obviously also to us and how God uh, really humbled me in just being able to do that. So it was, it was amazing. Sure was. And then where else did I go? Oh yeah. <laughs> so uh, Caitlin's been quite the world traveler. She was also in Uganda recently and uh, looking at a whole bunch of different things we're doing there, but also focusing on some of the Kwasha work that we've been really heavily involved in. So give us some of the updates there. Yeah, so if you've been around for a little while, we did our 2019 golf tournament for Kawasha, and so they actually finished everything in 2020, but because of the pandemic, we weren't able to go until now. So I went with a video team. We have an update coming for you, but it was really exciting because their team has taken the infrastructure we were able to provide and it has really benefited the community since then. So being there a few years down the line, you really see that impact. And a couple of the things that we had done, well, the big vision of that um, golf tournament was one school and one hospital. And so the video update will highlight more about the hospital. But one of the, even the cool things that I saw around the primary school was 
before, um, how the primary school is set up, they used to not have an overhang, so the kids would walk into the classroom and if it was torrential downpour, and I was just there during the rainy season, so it torrential downpours, the water would fill into the classrooms and kids would get soaked walking from class to class, so they were actually able to build an overhang um, over top so the classroom stayed dry. But then what they also did is they utilized it and created a water collection system through that. Then that gets funneled to these tanks up at the top of the hill. So it has given some water security throughout the year, especially in times of drought. So that was great. But then what they also did was they created these garden beds. So outside of each classroom, the new cl school year, the new classes get to plant a garden and watch it grow and see their own vegetables being grown. So really exciting things. And then the new thing that I got to see was uh, Kawasha has started this new initiative of a coffee farm. So they've created this business um, to really be able to sustainably fund the hospital. So I spent time with some of their national staff who are really leading this and taking the charge. And so we're going to be giving you more of an update on that through the video. But it was just really exciting. So I'm really thankful for our partnership with Kawasha and all that's happening in Uganda. Yeah, it's great just to see how we can do a partnership, we can even do like a fundraiser or something, but then the legacy of how we continue to be involved and even years and years after, seeing the impacts of, of what's happened just because we've come together as a team, as a church, uh, to do some incredible work uh, all around the world. It's amazing, so thanks for leading that. Now the last one is uh, one of our other big partners, IJM, International Justice Mission. We have a couple cool little updates for people about that, so tell us about that. Yeah, so coming this fall, we are doing another Freedom Sunday with them. And the reason we're doing it is because our last one was so impactful because of your response and some other really cool things that came from it. So we're going to have some of the IJM staff back with us. And this time, we're going to focus on their work in the Philippines around OSEC, which is the online sexual exploitation of children. It's really heartbreaking work, but all of IJM's work is really heartbreaking. But what's different about this one is just the really young ages that they're seeing of children being exploited. And so um, it also hits really close to home because it's often someone from Canada or Australia or one of our Western nations uh, that are being the ones that are sending money to people who then exploit the children. And so it hits really close to home. So it's important for us to be aware, to partner with IJM in this work. And what's special about that day is we actually have a survivor coming to share with us. So it's a really big honor to have her come and share her story, give us a glimpse into the realities of OSEC, but then also the hope that is being given through IJM, their staff, and through partnerships like the one with our church. So we're really looking forward to that, and I hope you'll you'll stay tuned for October. Yeah, I think it was when we did the last one, about almost a year and a half ago now, uh, I remember on this stage saying, why don't we as Village Church lead the Canadian church in this work? Why can't we do that? And what's been really cool over the last year and a half is that that's sort of been what's happening. IJM in Canada has actually leveraged what we did on that Sunday, and they've been recruiting and signing up churches all over the country based on what you guys did here a year and a half ago. They've actually leveraged that into a whole bunch of new partnerships all across the country. Uh, they're getting you know, us to be involved with other churches and all this kind of stuff. So it's, it's really cool to see the response. It's gonna be amazing in the fall. I think it's, isn't it like the first time they're actually gonna have a survivor from the field come and actually speak at a church like this with us? Yes, so it is. So it's oh, that's big. It's gonna be an incredible opportunity, an amazing Sunday when we do that. So look forward to that this fall. Thank you for all the work that you do uh, in this field. It's actually amazing, and you are the right person to be leading this at our church. So let's give Caitlin a hand for all the work that she does. And of course, we are continuing in our series in the book of Amos. So let's also give a big hand to Pastor Chris. Yeah, he knew. I want to know what happens up after I pick him up after round two. Um, if you weren't here, I picked Jeremy up once and almost lost my job. All right, so uh, we won't do it again, or maybe we will. <laughs> we'll take the opportunity as it comes. My name is Chris. I'm one of the lead pastors of one of our many locations of Village Church. I love to think that we at Village Church, if you're new here, are one church under all sorts of different rooms. Um, you know, I like to think that this here is the kitchen. All sorts of good stuff is cooked up here. Isn't that right? Yeah, and uh, wherever you might be might be the toilet. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just joking. It's not that. Every single room has perfect purpose, and we're so glad you're with us. Hey, we're going to be continuing in the book of Amos, and you're like, that sounds like one of those books I flipped past on the way to the important books, um, but you might actually not know where that is. So for that, let's turn to the first book of the Bible, the table of contents. Um, 
and as you flip there, you're going to see all these numbers that God in his sovereignty and kindness put there, and those are page numbers for you to be able to reference where you're going. I'm doing this with you so you guys can actually turn in your Bibles there, okay? Take the minute to do it, and you don't have to feel uncomfortable or awkward about it, um, and then so we're going to see, all right, so in mine 764, we can flip there and get rocking. Okay. So far in the book of Amos, we've seen a whole lot of God reaching out to his people through this prophet and trying to remind them of how they should function, of who they are in him, of how they've been turning away from him. And we're going to continue to lean into that in this passage, in this set of passages. We're in chapter 4, verse 6. And in this place, God is talking to his people again through Amos, and he's kind of saying, hey, I'm going to lay out all these things that I've done to get your attention, to show you and remind you who I am and who you are, and I'm going to really identify that you have not turned back to me the way that I've asked you to turn back to me. I'm trying to get your attention constantly. It's I'm trying to always tell you who you are and remind you who you are, and we need to take that too. So what I want to do is I want to read over, because you're going to find in these chunk of verses from verses 6 uh, to 13, is that it's kind of broken into two major parts. There's one side where he's talking directly to his people about something specific in their culture. We're going to see the need for us to understand that really quick as we start it. And then he moves into more of who he is and starts defining himself against what that culture is walking through. This might sound a little muddled, but let's, let's get into it so you get it. This is verse 6 of chapter 4 in the book of Amos. I gave you cleanliness of teeth in all your cities. Okay, just pause there for a second. Some of you are like, that sounds like God's blessing. All the dentists in here are like, amen. (laughs) You know, this is a great verse to remind us that context matters. You know, how we read the Bible, uh, we should not just read it through our 21st century lens of like how we think it should be read. Do you know what I'm saying? Sometimes we read these pages and we're like, what on earth is he actually talking about here? Cleanliness of teeth. Is that a thing where he's like, is there, was there a weird bleaching thing back there? Was it more attractive to have like dirty, rotten teeth or was it something else? Like what's actually happening? Sometimes you can get context even just from, watch this, the next verse. And a lack of bread in all your places. Oh, now I get it. It's not that he's just like keeping people's teeth polished and white so they have the most beautiful smiles in all of Israel. It's that he's actually doing something where he's creating famine in their land. He's not giving bread. He's keeping their teeth clean. It means they're not eating. That's what's actually happening in the text. It's important when we go through Old Testament texts that we read it with a lens that's not just ours. Because if we start reading all the things that are happening in the Old Testament, like as we go through some of the prophetic books or even some of the establishing books through the, like the first five books of the Bible, and we see these things that God is giving them as far as actions that they should and should not do, and we start thinking like, man, what does that mean? Can I not wear clothes with certain linens in them? Should I not get tattoos? Should I not boil a baby goat in its mother's milk? Like, you're always asking that question. <laughs> but you're just wondering like, what does it all actually mean for me? Well, c- get into the context of what he's trying to do here. Remember where the book was. Don't get caught up in just verse by verse picking out and applying right to your life because that's how you're going to get real messed up in your theology and practice. And you're going to also paint a really skewed picture of what God wants from you, which is really important, especially in a series of verses like this. And yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. I also withheld the rain from you. When there were yet three months the harvest, I would not send rain on one city and send no rain on another city, and one field would have rain, and the field on which it did not rain would wither. So two or three cities would wander to another city and drink water and would not be satisfied, and yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. I struck you with blight and mildew, your many gardens and your vineyards, your fig trees and your olive trees, the locust devoured, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. There's something happening in these first verses where God is engaging with his people directly about something that's happening in their world. You see what the Israelites and God's people at the time were doing is they were actually giving their time and their attention to another God, small g, God, another power that they believed in called Baal. And Baal was this one who was known for agriculture and, and, and um, things that would help them thrive. And so you notice as God goes through the things that he's giving you, he's saying, hey, I'm, I'm hitting you with famine and you didn't get my, you didn't get my, I didn't get your attention in that. I'm, I'm, I'm taking water from you. I'm not letting rain come as you try and go to ball for that. I'm actually not giving that to you. I'm the one who withheld the rain. It wasn't ball. I'm the one who withheld the food. It wasn't ball. I sent blight and, and, and different disease to your crops 
That wasn't Baal. It's not this God of agriculture because what's happening with the Israelites is there's this thing going on, and this is something that we often struggle with too. Every single one of us in this culture that we live in today, we struggle with exactly what they're struggling with. We might say, well, I don't actually like have other gods that I worship, but some of us really do. What this is called is called syncretism. And it's taking not just one God to be your God, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, the God of the Bible, who some of you believe in and say, man, I believe in Jesus, I believe in the Bible, I believe it's true. But then with the things of your life, you're not just going to God for them, you're going into every other place. You're waiting and you have your vision board for the universe to provide to you because maybe that might work. You go to the local rock shop and you look at all the cool things and you're like, this stone gives me healing, does it? And you start picking and choosing all the things you want because we think that's going to give us fulfillment. My wife and I, we wanted to go on like a cheap vacation, which seems to not exist anymore. But we found this spot called Great Wolf Lodge just south of Seattle. And I tell you, if you ever want to feel good about your body in a pool, go to Great Wolf Lodge. <laughs> I, I felt at home there, you know? Sometimes I'm tempted to keep my t-shirt on, not there. Mm -mm. It's just like, off, these are my people. These are my people. It's like going to 7-Eleven in, uh, in pajama pants, you know? It's, it looks weird, but it feels right. <laughs> And we went there, and it has all this fun stuff for kids. Like, the place is just made for kids. Like, heaven forbid you get one of the rooms near an elevator, because they got, like, five floors of this, like, magic quest thing where kids run around with wands and just point everywhere, and it's, like, talking to you about these quests and stuff. It's just, it's wild. But you know when I ask my kids, of all the fun things you did there, what was your favorite? You know what they told me? The buffet. <laughs> the buffet was my favorite. Why? Because they could go around, like, this buffet is an American buffet. I'm talking, like, gravy and fried chicken for breakfast. Now, like, it's not healthy, <laughs> but it's American. And you go there, and it's just, like, everything. They got pizza, and they got, like, sweets, and they got ice cream, and they got everything. So my kids, they load up their plate with all the stuff, thinking this is going to give me everything I want for the day, and they just carried their plates back. And they're like, oh, my God. I'm like, are you sure you need that? They're like, yes, we do. It was huge. And I'm like... What's it going to feel like after? Well, I'll tell you, there's a little indigestion after. <laughs> you see, but that's what we like to do even with our faith. God's like, hey, I have this, like, satisfying, healthy place that I want you to dwell with me in. I want you to be with me in this. And so he tries to get their attention in a whole lot of ways. I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places. I withheld the rain from you. I, I did physical things to try and get your attention. I struck you with blight and mildew. Your many gardens and your vineyards, your figs and your olive trees, the locusts devoured. I, I took away some of the things you depend upon that you've been looking to, to ball and that he would maybe provide for you. You hoped he would show up for you. And I, I, took, I took those things away. I did because that's who I am as God. I struck you, oh my goodness, this TV. I sent you amongst you a pestilence, disease in the manner of Egypt. I killed your young men with a sword and carried away your horses. This is the next verse we're going to get into. I made the stench of your camp go up into your nostrils. I overthrew some of you as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And yet... You did not, what, return to me? What's God's purpose in all the things that he's doing to his people? That they would return to him. God's hope for all the things that they've walked through is that they would return to him. Do you, know, do you notice what God didn't do? God didn't write a list of rules of what they should do. They, they, they didn't start saying, hey, now do this different and this different and this different. This is the starting point from which God is wanting you to get to. Hey, here's a question for you. And I could say it for our nation. I could say it for our church. I could say it for any one of us. Number one is, 
Has God in the recent past of your life been trying to get your attention? Would you say that he has for us as, as a world? Would you say things have been a little different recently than they have in the past? Has God been trying to get your attention? Well, the Christian walk, I mean, you could be taking this into all sorts of different directions. You could carry this with a whole lot of weight in your soul to every bad thing that happens and be like, man, okay, so I got this diagnosis. Is this God trying to get my attention? Is that what this is? Are you defining it for me? Can I then learn whatever God wants to teach me so that I don't have to go through this thing anymore? Well, not always. Well, did that bad thing then mean that God was just trying to get my attention in because he wants to teach me something? Well, well, maybe that God actually will use and does use bad things that happen to you to get your attention. Not all the time, but sometimes. Now, I know that's a really uncomfortable tension to sit with, but it's, it's a biblical one. Either way, whether it's life or it's God intentionally putting things into your life, the question is, has God gotten your attention? Did the, pandemic, did the pandemic change the church at all? Did it change how you function in the church at all? Did it change how you view the value of the gathering of people under God's name who come together once a week so that they can be spurred on to something more than just their own devices, own insular thoughts, own things for themselves, so that they can go come alongside one another and charge each other up so they can be put back into the world, driven by the Spirit of God so the world will see change around them because of Jesus working in and through their lives? God's hope is, and his cry for Israel and for all of us, is that we would return to him, that this is the starting point. The starting point is a baseline, is just being with God, returning to God, being close to God. And the starting point matters. It matters a lot. Before I got into ministry, I was a probation officer. Before I was a probation officer, I was a mall cop, like Paul Blart, exactly what you picture. And it was glorious. <laughs> like I had everything short of a Segway. I wished for a Segway. I hoped for one. We never had the budget. <laughs> but what me and my mall cop buddies did was we were connected to a YMCA, this mall that we worked at. And this YMCA, they, we just got like real close with the staff there. And we're like, hey, after hours, can we borrow some of the gym mats that you guys have? Like if you're not using them, they're like, yeah, absolutely. Come on over, take a cart and take them. And so our idea was that we would take these mats and we had these big sprawling like ventilation rooms in the mall. And we started laying down mats and we used it as like a training space for like cool like underground mixed martial arts stuff. And what turned out at first of a few guys just sparring with each other, then turned into like set up fights. Like, this guy's going to fight this guy. And what turned into set up fights amongst friends then turned into like small staff coming and watching those fights. And then what turned into small staff coming and watching those fights turned into like entrance music where you're coming into Rocky. You know, it's the eye of the tiger. It's... Yeah, it's just as bad as you think it was. And so I was, you know, in a few of these, these little underground fights. And I remember one time, like, I went to McDonald's after, and the girl's like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, why? And she's like, well, you're bleeding from your nose and your mouth. I just want to make sure, like, everything's all right. You know, around that time, I went into my, uh, my, my whole, like, certification to become a probation officer, and part of what they do is they do a background check on you, a criminal record check, and then an interview. And in that interview, they asked me, are you involved with any criminal activity? <laughs> well, you tell me. And I let them know about this. He's like, yeah, you should stop doing that. <laughs> I said, okay. So, so, so I changed something in myself because something outside myself is what I wanted more than what was inside myself. That's one way we change. Where we want to be seen a certain way, we want to have a certain thing, we want to do something, so we change outside ourselves. Fast forward a few years later and my dad passes away. When my dad dies, he had this family ring that he had on his hand that, he, by, that after he passed, my mom gave to my younger brother, but then took a whole bunch of family gold and printed a few more of these rings, had them made, exactly the same, so that each one of us sons could have a ring of our dad's family. 
when I see that ring or wear that ring, I actually think about more of who I actually am. And from who I am then produces who I want to be. You know, some of us have trinkets like this, like even this, this ring on my finger, this wedding band is actually my grandfather's wedding band. When he passed away, my grandmother sent it to me. I remember putting it on for the first time. It was way too big. I thought to myself, I'm not quite the man he is. You see, but reminding myself of who I am and knowing actually who I am and what I'm actually really part of then changes something in me. Do you see how the foundation, the beginning point matters? You see, the call of the Bible on your life is not to return to God by doing all the right things. It's to return to God so that you abide and spend time with him. Abiding is actually language from the New Testament in which Jesus tells us to abide with him. And here's the point. What you're rooted into will produce fruit in you. Does that make sense? What you're rooted into will produce fruit in you. And so what you're binding yourself to or spending time in or giving yourself to or putting your hope in will change the outcome of things in your life. And what we see in the Israelite picture of all the things they're doing, all the stuff that's coming their way, what we see for God's judgment on their life is actually a result of their choice from what they're rooting into because they're not rooting into an abiding relationship with God. Has God been trying to get your attention? Has he? And if he has, then what has been your response? Has it been to try and read the Bible more because that's what you think he wants from you? Is it maybe God, oh, I don't want this in my life, so now I'm going to start coming to church because I think then you'll bless me. Is it I've been single for so long and it hurts so bad, I just want something different And so I start trying to do all the religious things so that you'll give me what I want. I want more money, God, so I'll start like doing what I think you want from me. God just wants you to return to him. He wants you to return to him. We watched some videos recently, old videos of our kids as they were, you know, as they've been growing up. And they came across this one video of our youngest taking his first steps. And we have four sons. I tell you, like, it was just powerful just to watch. Like, I'm sitting there behind the camera, and I'm videotaping. And my wife, as this little baby Beckham, like, gets up on his feet and, like, kind of stumbles and takes, like, one little step. She just, like, celebrated him. She was so excited about what was happening because of him taking that step. And then he kind of collapsed. And you think we'd be bored of it by now. Yeah, this is what happens. We've had four. This is our fourth one. You think the fourth kid gets all the scraps, right? That's why they're so wild. But no, every single step, every single stumble, every single like little was celebrated. I just think that's what God does for us when we decide to actually return to him. When we don't make it about like our best religious shot, our best like try at trying to do church well or our best shot again this year. Oh man, I'm going to read the Bible cover to cover and then you get to numbers and are like, nope. Mm -mm, No time for that. But what if I read it in pieces? I'll read this chapter, this chapter, this chapter. No, mm -mm, can't. No, it's like, I just think that God, like, he loves you so much. His primary objective for your life is that you would be close to him. He's so, like, any time you just take a step of just releasing, oh, man, I'm not, okay, okay, Jesus, like, I, I know you say you're going to be all sufficient for me. Okay, um, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let this go, then I'm going to trust you in this situation. I just feel like God is just like celebrating that. Every step you take towards him, he never gets bored of it. He never gets tired of it. He just loves you, and he wants to see you take steps towards him because that's where you're going to thrive. Because what you root yourself into produces fruit in you. The outcomes of what you choose, man, they'll just be different when you're walking those with God. Even when you're walking really hard things. Anybody ever go through something that you wish you knew the outcome of? Surprised not more hands are in the room. (laughs) Where you're like, man, I wish I knew how that was going to go. And then when you get there, you're like, why did I stress about that thing so hard? Why did I ruin relationships and friendships and family and all these things? 
You know, I have this friend, his name's Jerome, and uh, Jerome Avery, and he's actually a Paralympic sprinter. He's a, he's a pace runner for a blind man named David Brown. And when I say friends, we're Instagram friends. We follow each other, but that's no matter. <laughs> we're pretty well, pretty well friends. <laughs> we're pretty close. <laughs> Watching these guys run together is remarkable. I'm not, they're not trotting along. Like, these guys are fast runners. Like, these are like, this is like a dream pace. Like, I wish I could run that fast. And Jerome and David, they train together and they run. And they stay linked together as they're running. And David, who can't see, just listens to Jerome. Go, go, go. Let's keep going. I'm with you. I'm with you. Let's go, 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 go. And they run and they run and they run. And it doesn't matter what's ahead of them. David doesn't know what's happening in front of him. David just runs. And you watch them run and their steps are in sync. Every single foot, it hits the ground at the exact same time and releases at the exact same time. And they go 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 and they go. And he stays right next to him, reminding him, hey, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. And he keeps pace with his voice and his hold. And this is the thing that God's trying to do with you. He says, I see the future of what you're walking through. I know the things that you have to carry in your life. I see what's coming. I see what's before you. Do not walk away into other things. Do not turn sideways and try and go your own way. Stay close to my voice. Stay close to my touch. Stay close to where I am because you go with the one who sees. You go with the one who is king. You go with the one who has control more than ball or crystals or your greatest like world leader or thought leader has. You go with God who knows and has power over all the things that could happen in your life. That's the God you run with. So do not walk away from me. Return to me and run with me. Like, This is the power of God with his people. He's saying, don't go for the buffet Christianity. Go for me. Let me be the one. Has he been trying to get your attention? And has he? Your response should be that you return to him. Now, it's really interesting what he does throughout all these passages. You'll notice, and the reason why I put this up by itself is because this was the end declaration of all the different things. Let's continue in verse 9 and 10 and 11 just so we can see this continue. I sent amongst you, this is verse 10, I sent among you a pestilence after the manner of Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword and carried away your horses. And I made the stench of your camp go up into your nostrils. And yet you did not return to me, declares the... Lord, I overthrew some of you when God overthrew Sodom, as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and as you were a brand plucked out of the burning, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. Lord, Lord, declares the Lord. Baal, actually, if you defined it and actually wrote it out in the language and what it actually means, it actually also means Lord. God is establishing himself as an ulterior to the other things that you put your faith and trust in. He says, I am Lord. But what he's doing here in establishing himself as Lord, as God, over Baal, over other things, is he's saying, I am the only way. I am the only option. And you can't have some of me. You can't have me and other things. You have only me and all of me or nothing at all. That's what God's trying to establish here. He's saying, I am the Lord of your life. That is the position and the seat I want you to have. You know, I tell you, some of us are okay with this when it comes to our eternity. God, you can have my eternity. Man, that sounds like a great place. I want to go to heaven. Is it like the Philly cheese commercials where there's like little angels on the clouds and like we're eating crackers together? I want that life. But we're, we're good with giving God our eternity, but we're, we aren't willing to give him our present. We're good with saying, God, you are Lord of my eternity. My destination is secure with you. And what God does through this whole section with Baal, he's not talking about eternity stuff. He's talking about now. He's talking about agriculture and water and rain and disease and war and sickness and overthrowing and like He's talking about your present. God doesn't just want to be Lord of your eternity. He wants to be Lord of your life now and forever. He wants to have you now and forever. He wants you to walk with him for now and for forever. Which means what practically? It means that some of us as Christians need to stop pretending like God is Lord of our life if we've just given him our our eternity and not willing to have him be Lord of our life now. Because this word Lord, it's not just like a when I feel like it kind of thing. You know, when I got married to my wife, I'm thinking lots about weddings because wedding season just kicked off. 
thinking lots. Okay, listen, when I became a husband to my wife, I wasn't just a husband when I wanted to be a husband. I don't just get to be faithful when I want to be faithful. I get to be faithful to my wife because that's what I am now. That's who I am. That's what I've committed to. That's what I've coveted myself to. And what God has done for his people is he's created something called a covenant. Now here's what a covenant is. It's different than a contract. It's something that says, it's like I'm binding myself to you for forever. This is not gonna be negotiated or changed or broken or amended. It's binding, it's forever, this, this linking. And what God does is he as Lord establishes his covenant with his people and keeps it the whole time. Now what we do is we keep walking away from him consistently with our minds, with our desires, with our thoughts, with our hopes. And we walk away from him and we get this picture that it's like, it's okay for us just to come back to God when we want to. When we need something, when we feel a little off, oh man, I can return to God as Lord. That's what I'm ready to do. But Lord means Lord all the time. Lord means like, you don't get to say no to a Lord in your life. Like if God actually is Lord, if you're saying, God, you're my Lord, Lord God Almighty, and you're singing these songs to him and you're claiming these things over your life and saying, Jesus, you are the only way for me. You claim him as Lord. You don't get to say no to his call on your life. You don't get to say no. Because God has never played on your terms. He plays on his. And his terms are far better than yours. Because he knows more. He sees more. He goes further. He creates more. He has sovereignty over everything. And yet we just love to come once in a while when we need him, Lord. He has so much more for you than that. And you're going to find, and I think what this set of verses is going to do for us, and I hope it does for you, is it's going to actually maybe just curb your thoughts about who God actually is. Because I'll tell you what the picture of some of your, in some of your minds of who God is right now. It is Jesus holding a lamb, white, with long, flowy hair, and it's this patient, graceful, always kind, always easy, laid back, passive, one that no matter what you do, he's always going to be like, hey, yeah, hey, yeah, I'm always smiling at you. I'm always good with you. I'm just going to stay here and pet my lamb. God is... God defines himself as Lord, and then watch how he continues to define exactly who he is. Verse 13, for behold, he who forms the mountains and creates the wind and declares to man what is his thought, who makes the morning darkness and treads on the heights of the earth, the Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. For behold, this is your God, guys. Just he who forms the mountains. You ever drive through them? You ever see them? The one who formed them. Like I'm from Winnipeg. Every time I see a mountain, it's clear. I'm like, oh, it's there. It's real. Like our mountains in Winnipeg, we had a garbage dump hill, the Brady Landfill. We call that a mountain. Some of you Winnipeggers from a Winnipeg site will know this. They actually take old landfills and then put grass on them and they become like running parks in Winnipeg. I'm not joking. That's like, no, the one who forms the mountains, the one who creates the wind, the one who actually like creates it to blow, declares to man what is his thought, all these depths of who you are and like these existential things you hold, all the wonders, all the questions of the universe and your value and place in it, all your purpose questions, all the things of identity. God put those into you. Who makes the morning darkness and treads on the heights of the earth over all created things. That's, that's your God. This almighty, powerful, awe-inspiring picture of who God is, just how big and awesome and wonderful and awe-inspiring and yet terrifying that should be. Maybe you didn't catch the terror and the beauty. But in all through this passage, God has been naming himself as Lord. 
redefining what the people of Israel are putting their faith into. And then at the end, he takes this and he truly defines who he is. The God of hosts. Now remember what I said earlier. This does not mean he's just a great hospitality person. The God of hosts. What does this mean? What is this? This is war speak. This is the God of armies. Angelic and human. The one who holds destinies and creates authorities and moves perimeters and places and settings. He's not simply the Jesus who's holding a lamb and is meek and mild. He's the Jesus of Revelation who comes as a warlord with fear and trembling to those who would oppose him. A warlord who overcomes the armies, who commands the armies. Oh, now, whoa, wait a minute. This God, not just a kind, subtle God, but this God with this kind of power, who this kind of army-driven power, like the commander, the God of armies, is the one who formed the mountains. Take another look at them. Not just a small, beautiful thing. It's like you have incredible power, incredible strength, incredible ability, incredible sovereignty. You create the wind. We not be, you know, we've had a few windstorms here, but man, go to like the tornado belt of America. You ever been near something like that? You see the storm, God creates those winds. It can be terrifying. Church, we need to catch again this picture of who God actually is, the grandness, the might, the almighty. The God of hosts is sometimes the God you need to put your faith in and know that this God is on your side. Now, how did he prove that? Because at one moment in all of history, he was given the opportunity to take all the evil things on, the things that are in us, the sin of the world, the moments when it seemed like the enemy of the world, the devil actually had triumph over his people. In this moment, God sent his son Jesus to come and live amongst his creation, to live amongst the mountains that he formed, to stand and breathe in the wind that he sets, to have thoughts, because Jesus was fully God and fully man, and to live amongst his people. And God in the flesh came and lived amongst us, and he lived perfectly in his own personal life, overcoming every single, every single piece of what he might be tempted to. He overcame those things. And then innocent, in a moment of darkness where it looked like there was triumph for the evil one over him, he was put to death in our place that we deserved on the cross. And Israel, holding to this definition of who God is, would have been absolutely shocked. There's no way, there's no way that the God of hosts, the God of armies, the God who oversees all the angelic armies of all of creation would ever be defeated by a stick he created and metally put in the ground. How could he be killed in a moment like that? And so the Son of God, one of the perfect pieces of the Trinity, Jesus died. And for three days he laid dead. And for three days this was put into question. What is happening here? But on the third day, life filled his body. One who was physically, literally dead in every way rose from the dead came back to life. What did this show, church? It showed that this is true. You think the enemy took over? You think the enemy won? It's true. God is the victor. 
God is the one who holds supreme power. God is the one who is the king of all things. God is the one who is the God of hosts, the God of armies. And once again, the warlord king rose from the dead and came back to life, showing that he had triumph and power over all the things that you have great fear in your heart over, all the things that you turn to other things for in your life. God, send the rain. If not God, Mother Nature, would you do it? God, heal my body. If not you, would this universe board or these crystals or this Wiccan stuff or like what, what's going to actually do this? God made a statement in Amos 4.13 that came true and showed its validity in the resurrection of Jesus. And that means you today don't have to live as God of just your eternity, but you get to say, he is Lord for my eternity and for today because the one who walks with me and knows my path and goes with me is actually truly alive and Lord of my life. So you don't have to get caught saying, no, 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 God, I'm gonna do it my way. You say, God, I'm going to get it done your way. It's going to make a bad joke. Nahweh, Yahweh. <laughs> That's the name of God in the Old Testament for those of you who are new. It's a weird Christian joke. You know, this book of Amos is so interesting because we see all these moments of God just reminding the Israelites who he is. Let's not forget that. Whatever you're carrying in your life, don't forget who he is. Don't forget what he commands. Don't forget the power he has. Don't forget what he's done for you. Don't forget that, hey, guess what? If you're in a relationship with him, if you like believe in God, he not only just goes with you, he actually lives in you. Like really, I'm talking like real experience change. Not just of your desires, but of your own internal experiences of the things that are happening in your life. So don't spend your life rooting yourself to all the other things. Root yourself in God. Root yourself in the resurrection of Jesus. Root yourself in the power of the Holy Spirit and see the fruit that that bears in your life and how it changes you. You know, the Bible, I'm just going to tell you, they, they say a lot of really good things about what's going to happen. Peace, joy, patience, just to name a few. Like, it's, it keeps, it's incredible what God will do in your life. And so for some of you who've been searching all the other places, the book of Amos reminds us, hey, return to me. Maybe for the very first time, just turn to me and take that step and, hey, don't stop going to all these other places. I'm available to you and I'm with you. And for a lot of us who maybe claim Jesus as Lord, it's reminding us, hey, return to me again with the now and just see how I'm going to work through that. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you so much for a set of verses like this in the book of Amos this clarifying piece of who you are, God. Help us to believe it to be true for our lives. Help us to believe that you truly are the one you say you are. That you are a victorious king. Jesus, that you are seated on a throne in heaven. You're sitting because the victory's been won. You've proven to be the God of hosts you've said you were all along. So help our hearts and our minds, our thoughts, our affections, our desires to return to you as a baseline, to abide with you, to be with you, to be present with you. And that means sometimes turning away from all the other things. God, help us to do that. Give us that fruit of the spirit of self-control sometimes when we need it so that we just actually be able just to turn to you again. And as we rest and abide and work and live and function and parent and be friends and in all these things, help our life with you to change the now. Because you are the Lord of now and the Lord of forever. 
We thank you, Jesus, for these powerful truths. Help us to live in them. Help us to be different because of them. Help us as a church to be powerfully on mission with this gospel of good news to the world around us who's going everywhere else but you. Hey, but we know it's you. We pray this in your powerful, beautiful name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Oh, the perfect Son of God in all his innocence. You're walking in the dirt with you and me. He knows what living is. He's acquainted with our grief. The man of sorrow, son of suffering. Oh, blood and tears, how can it be? If there's a God who weeps, if there's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah. Son of suffering. So imagine you are distant and removed. But you chased us down in merciful pursuit. To the sin of you were grace and the broken you.
to God forever Oh, blood and tears How can it be There's a God who weeps There's a God who bleeds Oh, praise the one Who would reach for me Hallelujah to the son of suffering. Hallelujah. 